Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another edition of our Pfizer chat. Uh, Shreyas Deshmukh and I, Pallavi Adi, we are the co-founders of Asian Pathfinders. Uh, so another interesting session in our series in July on global terrorism uh, issues. So we're looking at the role of new tech in spread of terrorism. We have two amazing speakers and an amazing moderator too. Uh, we have Daniel Cohen and Kabir Taneja as our speakers and Simran Taneja as our moderator. Before I give it to Simran for the session, just a brief about Asian Pathfinders. I know a lot of you know about us just for the new ones. So we're a knowledge sharing platform that started in 2020. We are here to uh, get uh, speakers like scholars, practitioners, academics together for constructive dialogues. Uh, we do that through our fireside chats, which is on Saturdays and dialogues, which is on the last Thursday of the month. And again, uh, we are an informal way for you to connect. So you know, if you have any feedback, any ideas for future sessions, please do reach out to us. And if there's something that we can do, we'll definitely do it together. And uh, about our upcoming sessions, like I said, this entire month is related to terrorism centric issues. So the next one is looking at some more from an ideological or geopolitical fallout. Basically, what does terrorism exactly is it both? Is it more of ideological? Is it more geopolitical? And like I said, the entire series in July. So details of our next session will definitely be on our social media. So we will post the links and everything there and you can always join it. Uh, our sessions are open, so if you want to share it with others, also your post classes too. Uh, guidelines, first and foremost, please stay on mute because we do record our sessions and put it on YouTube later for the benefit of the wider community. So request you to stay on mute. And then again, uh, a lot of these topics are very emotive. We have very strong opinions, but we do uh, request you to not post defamatory, abusive content here. We will uh, have to unfortunately remove you from the group then, and please let us not do that. Uh, so how to reach us? This is just, you can look us up on social media, we are there. And about uh, today's session, uh, I'll introduce Simran and she'll uh, speak about uh, the other speakers. So Simran is a geopolitical uh, intelligence analyst specializing in security analysis for businesses operating in the South Asian region. Uh, she's currently the security specialist for South Asia at International SOS. Uh, so far in her career, Simran has specialized in risk mitigation with the focus on narratives on militancy in addition to the political economy of the region. She holds a Bachelor's of Arts in IR, uh, International Relations. Uh, she's also fluent in English, Hindi, and proficient in Marathi, Spen French, Spanish, and Gujarati. So over to you, uh, Simran. Thank you so much, Pallavi, and good morning, everyone. Uh, last, uh, big thanks to Asian Pathfinders for the second session in this ongoing series of uh, terrorism. Last week, uh, Dr. Hans Jacob Schindler discussed the state of global terrorism in the con contemporary time. And today we're looking to dive a little deeper into the role of new age technology in the spread of terrorism with uh, our two speakers. So at the, I'll serve to introduce the subject a little. At the most basic level, access to the internet has enhanced terror planning and ex execution capabilities. With Islamic terror especially, we've probably seen its most widespread use with leaders such as bin Laden and al-Baghdadi releasing videos for propaganda and relevancy as they continue to be hunted by governments. Uh, followers, sympathizers, and members participate actively on social media channels such as Telegram, uh, Signal, Rocket Chat, and most recently, Threema, all of which use levels of encryption to keep chats private from agency surveillance. Online anonymous forums like uh, 8chan took popularity in the West with anti-Islamic and right-wing ex extremists because of mil minimal regulation. And in March 2019, the Christchurch shootings in um, two mosques were scream streamed live on forum. In past years, government's efforts with data laws, limitations on online permissibility, and its tryst with internet censorship continues to mark constant transmission of related information in the public domain. So the, adm the advent of accessibility to new tech also allows militants to assemble increasingly complex weapons such as drones, first used by ISIS Sujan in 2014. And this continues to pose an enhanced risk through a sort of amended modus operandi. Uh, and as, as 
this technology and technique becomes more known and available, so also does 3D printing. The risk and effectiveness of terrorists making their own weapons will likely further increase. All of these bring forth the question, where do we stand with understanding, assessing and mitigating these risks? I'd now yield the floor to Head of Policy and Technology uh, at the EBA, EBA Ivan Institute, uh, Dr. Uh, Daniel Cohen. Uh, short uh, introduction. Da Daniel Cohen is a cybersecurity and policy expert, and he's the head of policy and technology at the Eb ABBA Eban Institute. I'm so sorry, and a research fellow at the International Institute for Counterterrorism, both the IDC Hergelia. He's also senior researcher at the Blavatnik Interdisciplinary uh, Cyber Research Center and at uh, at the Tel Aviv University. His research fields include cybersecurity and cyber terrorism, focusing on the use of web and social media by terror organizations. He previously served as a research fellow and coordinator of the cybersecurity and military strategy programs at the Institute for National Security Studies and worked as a consultant in the public sector, including as a consultant and expert on violent extremism and radicalization for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Daniel is a lecturer at Bailan University Department of Management and IDC Hergelia Schools of Government and Communications. He holds a master's in security studies from Tel Aviv University and a bachelor's degree in government and strategy from IDC Hergelia. He is currently a PhD candidate at Bailan University Department of Management. Next, Kabir Taneja is a fellow at the Strategic Studies Program at the Observer Research Foundation. And also he's the author of the ISIS Peril, the world's most feared terror group and its shadow on South Asia. And now yield to Daniel Cohen to begin with his opening remarks. Thank you very much. A good morning from Israel and good afternoon uh, for most of you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Really happy to be here in this important discussion and looking forward for uh, fruitful uh, insights on the subject. I'll just share my presentation and uh, we'll start my talk. Everybody can see it? Good? Good. So, um, as you mentioned in the introduction, uh, most of our discussion regarding new tech will be uh, on the topic of uh, the web, social media, instant messaging, uh, especially when we talk about the spread of terrorism. Uh, we need to take under consideration that we will see emerging threats uh, regarding terrorism from other uh, technologies like 3D printers, drones, artificial intelligence, blockchain, qu quantum computing, that's joking. We have still have time for that. Uh, but we, uh, we, we focus on the spread and on the web because of the early adoption that we saw in the previous years uh, by the organizations using the cheap and off-the-shelf products that were offered for them and then enable them to spread the terrorism. So again, this will be my main focus for today. I will speak about the terrorism use of uh, the web uh, with practical case studies. Uh, also, uh, uh, regarding the response for, for terrorism uh, by uh, industry, private sector, but of course from governments, uh, less academic world, but uh, I will uh, offer in my third part a uh, rules and responsibilities model uh, that uh, we are trying to promote at our institute in IDC Italia uh, regarding a cross sector uh, hybrid model uh, where can be uh, many advances, relative advances from different sectors to uh, confront and counter terrorism, especially on the use of them on the web. So let's start with terrorism use of the web. Um, I'm sure many of you can see some parts of it where they will say, okay, we're missing some of it, but I see this uh, eight main areas of uh, use of the web by uh, terrorism. Of course, cyber terrorism or cyber uh, warfare, 
as that we see funding by cryptocurrency or in more traditional ways of uh, donations by false charities on the uh, blogs and uh, sites online. Organized and non-organized terrorist attacks, uh, mainly for uh, secure communication, but also some part of the operational and intelligence gathering of it. PSYOPs, of course, we saw it by, as you mentioned, ISIS and Al-Qaeda using it heavily. Radicalization, incitement online, um, recruitment, and of course, uh, the a platform that enables end-to-end -end encryption for communication among members and also for the recruiting of uh, new members. So this is maybe for me the big thing that I'm uh, focusing on and we'll focus on uh, also today on uh, some of them. So let's start with a practical example that I will try to argue that because that it's cheap and off-the-shelf products, we see actually a, a opposite evolution of terror organizations that in the past were uh, trying to adapt dual use of technology that was uh, uh, imported from militaries. Uh, for example, on the cyber warfare side, we saw terror organizations focusing on trying to build mechanism to uh, hack into critical infrastructure. After it foiled and after the understanding that uh, you need heavily investment of human capital, but also of techno technological capabilities, we saw them moving to humans, meaning um, producing of human devices that were actually aiming for the humans themselves. And I'll have you a couple of examples. I'll start with uh, the one on the left side, upper left. Uh, we see here a Syrian electronic army um, defacement attack against uh, the Twitter account of uh, Associates with press, blaming, uh, it was in 2012, blaming President Obama, uh, saying that he was injured. This is after he threatened the Assad regime to uh, bomb them and uh, interfere in the war in Syria. It was only on the start of it, but then it was revealed that they were using chemical weapons. And after that, we saw uh, Dow Jones, Wall Street numbers like uh, falling down and uh, lost of a lot of money only because of a defacement attack on uh, in Associated Press, uh, cheap, uh, off-the-shelf uh, products that were being used, and eventually created fear, uncertainty, and doubt, uh, using it as a deterrent tool uh, for PSYOPs. ISIS hacking division, very notorious, uh, guys that came, uh, a lot of them came with, uh, immigrated to the Islamic State, to Araka, and Mosul in Iraq, and Iraq in Syria. Some of them uh, were decentralized, but found ways to communicate between them all around the world. And uh, some of them were actually pretty good hackers, but they were also investing their capabilities. <laughs> okay, thanks. And they were also investing on the cognitive or behavioral side of it, of, uh, of cyber warfare, uh, enabling them to use it as some kind of uh, influence operations. We have here an example of the famous hacking into the US Central Command Facebook and Twitter accounts, then publishing on, uh, on the tour on the darknet hit list of American personnel that were supposedly fighting against them in, uh, in Syria and bombing them from the American planes or the coalition planes. And this is, was kind of the modus operandi that we saw from those guys. We didn't see any hacking into critical infrastructure, only threatening to do so. Now, more recent uh, examples, uh, the upper right side, we have an example from Hamas, Hamas in Gaza, that actually five years ago were aiming on critical infrastructure or trying to uh, gather information from sensitive uh, and well-guarded uh, uh, service in uh, Israel uh, military industry or military um, servers and assets. Uh, they failed on that and then they were starting to understand that they can do something much more effective and less cost and everything is off the shelf. So they started to produce apps on a uh, on uh, uh, Google Play, 
it was uh, towards the uh, the World Games in uh, in uh, soccer in uh, 2018, and they just produced apps that they said, okay, if we can uh, do some kind of social engineering on Facebook and we can locate Israeli young soldiers now guarding on the border with Gaza, and then we can produce an apps, we can offer them to them in a sophisticated way. Once they will download those apps, we can uh, take over their cell phones, and then we can start gather intelligence from those bases that are right next to the Gaza Strip for the next time that there will be a conflict in Gaza. So really interesting, and again, from humans to, from machines to humans. Now the last example, actually we had last week, it was revealed in Israel, a huge campaign by uh, Hamas using cryptocurrency, uh, bitcoins uh, for donation, but also uh, as part of uh, planning of uh, terrorist attacks. And here we have a donation campaign to Hamas from uh, uh, a year and a half ago, if I remember right. And this is also something that needs to be taken under consideration. Uh, and we can see it blockchain technology or cryptocurrency apart, but of course it's part of uh, every day now in the web and the terror organization are taking uh, advantage of uh, the use of that for donation, but also they can use it uh, to run their own uh, terror attacks using it. So this is my case studies regarding it, but again, when we talk about the web, we talk about mainly heavily social media. Social media was uh, is an uh, enable that uh, gave the terror organizations like uh, Islamic State or Al Qaeda the opportunity to reach, engage. Uh, even at some point, we saw manipulation of algorithms that created more trends, and then they were able to reach to more people. We saw a hashtag hijacking again, uh, soccer games. Of Football games in the past were very popular for them to hashtag, uh, to hijack hashtags. And actually, uh, it was a real like open new brave world that they were able to use it uh, to get maximum exposure for psychological warfare, for recruitment uh, of new uh, potentially uh, terrorists in the future. In the second part, I will uh, show you uh, what was being done against it. Again, I don't have a lot of time, so it will be really quick. Um, but I will say that uh, it enabled them in the first evolution to reach many, many people that were outside what we called the bubble filter or so on. Uh, so on their audience, the targeted audience, they could recruit by it. And on the audience that they were fighting, they can use it for psyops. Uh, of course, it's not only the one uh, Facebook account that you can reach more people and uh, then you can get to exposure to hundreds or thousands of millions of people, but it's also a question of, uh, uh, of a targeted audience that are from different groups and the interaction between them. But what really stopped it in some way or, or created the path to the next uh, evolution was first of all, end-to-end -end encryption and second, instant mobile messaging. That is very different uh, architecture of uh, web from social media. And then we saw uh, different approaches. Of course, there was countermeasures against them that they created it. And what it meant eventually is that we see today more uh, decentralized way of uh, uh, creating content and sharing them and spreading them online. So we see more exclusive groups of uh, terror organizations on uh, the darknet, in Telegram, in WhatsApp, and other places in VK, for example. And it's very different from what we saw, let's say five, six years ago on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Telegram, uh, Tumblr, and so on. So today it's much more decentralized, less like hubs that created the uh, uh, content and spread them. Um, what is, I think is good from that aspect is now we see more containment of this uh, phenomena online and it's less spread it, but from the other side of it, it's more exclusive. Meaning if someone uh, can be lured to a darknet forum and then being shut uh, anonymous, uh, in an anonymous way that is encrypted, maybe there's a more chance that it can be a, a good quality a potential recruitment to an organization like ISIS, for example. But at least for us on the other side of the table, uh, we see it less and less as phenomena, uh, meaning it doesn't, it's not trendy as it was in the past. 
So what is being done against as a response to this kind of terrorism? I'll go really quickly on it. I will say, first of all, there's a lesson learned from other fights that can be, that also were being used against terrorism. This is an example from Twitter, uh, I think from two years ago. Their funnel of defenses against uh, fake news and disinformation spreading. Uh, I will speculate that the same kind of uh, clustering uh, using the artificial intelligence. And in the end of the table, we see also human analysts that are reviewing it. It's pretty much what is being done against the fight against terrorism and the use of uh, terrorism to spread their uh, messages online. So what we see here can be a good example of the model. Another good example from the industry uh, will be GIFT CP. Uh, when you share uh, data between different uh, social media platforms, you can get very fast and very effectively the removal of content from all of the platforms. So Give City uh, by governments, by Facebook, Twitter, uh, Apple, Google, and many other uh, smaller platforms will be able to uh, remove content very fast, very effectively. And maybe no one can really measure it. This is one of the main reasons that we see less and less uh, terror organization use of content on those platforms. It doesn't mean that we don't see it on other platforms from the other side of it. But this is, a, I believe, a good model that needs to be more implemented in uh, other areas, of course. Now, they took it from uh, the war against pedophiles, uh, and it's a good model that was implemented against uh, terrorism also. Now, we have also counter-narrative campaigns. Uh, it started as a complete failure of the State Department against ISIS. But in the second evolution, they understood that they need to be more flexible, more uh, collaboration with uh, private sector, but also with academics. Then we saw more data science, better reach to the audience and better focus on what the content that they were trying to share. So if in the beginning, I think again, anyway, uh, for me, I, I think that it was a failure because it didn't reach the right audience. On the second evolution of this kind of centers to counter narrative, uh, we saw better and better and effective results against terrorism. Of course, against ISIS was the first time we saw a cyber warfare being used. And we go very quickly on what they did. Uh, it was a joint operation of the coalition, but mainly the five eyes countries. And uh, you can see here what they did against ISIS. Um, they decided not to focus on what we see on the end the clients, the target audience, but actually to uh, try to counter the people that produce the content or the organization behind it. And they were able to uh, spread malware, for example, to block jihadist access to data, disrupted their ability to operate, actually cut the chain of supply of content. What is also interesting that the GCHU from UK and also the Australians we're focusing on the on to disrupt the terrorist cash uh, transactions uh, using cyber warfare. So this is really interesting and was, uh, I believe, really effective against uh, the terror in this case. Now, just to end it, I will say that uh, in the past there was no regulation. It was a chaos. This is Sweden when they switch uh, the direction of the road. So don't do it back in India or do it very, very slowly, not like in Sweden. So it was a complete chaos in the beginning and it took time for it to progress. I think that we need to see more regulation. This is the first traffic light in the world, in UK, uh, that will create more uh, a management of the chaos that is today. And it applies also to 3D printers, drones, artificial intelligence and so on, not only for uh, social media and the web. Uh, what I'm trying to promote as a model in my institute is a cross-sector collaboration, uh, taking advantage of a uh, relative advantage of each sector, the need of the government, the tools, technological tools in the private sector, and using the civic society or the academic world as a platform. When you drill it down, it looks something like this. I will go only for what I marked in red. The government can synchronize it. They know the priorities. Uh, we have great example of shared industry uh, hash databases that I showed you before, like GIFCP, 
The way to do it is using heavily technologies that is in the private sector. And uh, platforms like yours or mine that uh, can be a hub for knowledge sharing uh, of uh, new uh, insights, new trends regarding the, uh, the terrorism that then can be in a way of, uh, of collaboration between the sectors, we can take it and make it more effective to fight against them. Thank you very much. And uh, of course, I will read, I'm looking forward to hear your questions and uh, the debate later on. Thank you so much, Daniel, uh, for this insightful uh, deep dive into just how social media is used and also for your recommendations on the subject. Uh, I think we'll uh, move on to Kabir's opening remarks now, uh, if you're ready. Uh, yeah, thanks, Imran. Uh, and that was a really good and comprehensive uh, presentation by Daniel. Uh, he's covered a lot of ground, which makes my job much easier than I was expecting. Uh, but you know what? Uh, I'll take some of the key points that Daniel raised uh, when it comes to technology and terror, since it has become a very uh, sort of uh, up and coming topic when we are dealing with terrorism now, right? So recently we saw the whole drone issue play out in, in, in Jammu, for example, and there was this euphoria in India, to, you know, 24 hour news channels of this sort of new way of uh, how terrorism is conducting, having reached uh, Indian shores and how should we prepare and, uh, you know, what are the technological advances to counter technological advances, so on and so forth. But I think one of the things that also, uh, you know, this highlighted is the fact that, you know, uh, we should come to a uh, understanding that at some level, policy responses to technology have always, you know, uh, been slower than the technological innovation itself. And I think that bridge where uh, security uh, issues are trying to sort of catch up to uh, decentralization of technology, as you know, Daniel also put it. Uh, it's 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 sort of uh, well, for, for, you know, first and foremost, technology is not some. Uh, it's not, not only now that terror groups are using technology, right? Even when they were using IEDs in 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 the 90s, that was also still technology. Just that it wasn't that high tech as it seems so right now. But it, it's still that they, they were managing to build explosives. They were still managing to build, uh, uh, you know, detonators. They were still managing to uh, blow up planes. Uh, you know, that all uh, was sort of uh, playing into the part that they were using the best available resources at that point of time available to them uh, uh, to, to their advantage. And it's still the same thing. This that has become much, much more easier now. Right. So, for example, the whole uh, uh, drone issue in, in Jammu, uh, ultimately, what is it? It's a quadcopter, right, the, which is uh, bought off the shelf in most cases. And even if, uh, you know, you, we try to learn uh, uh, about the drone tech in terrorism from, uh, from examples in Syria, for example, you know, there, there were drones that were caught in northern Iraq, uh, you know, uh, sort of being assembled to uh, release uh, explosives uh, in one form or the other that were actually purchased in India, then taken to the United Kingdom, activated in the United Kingdom, and then, you know, uh, somehow finding their way to, to, to northern Iraq. Now, you don't know what that trajectory was or how it ended up there, but, uh, but uh, because it's an off-the-shelf technology, uh, uh, you know, it's very difficult to try and, and have sort of uh, countermeasures to it. And that's, that's something that we, uh, it's not just India or not just uh, Israel or US. That's, you know, uh, a, what a lot of countries are facing now. Uh, for example, uh, when we're talking about social media, uh, just the fundamentals of what it started as and what it has become have changed. And I'm not even talking about terrorism here. Right. I'm talking about something very basic. I mean, basic stuff like the democratization of information, uh, of how we consume information uh, and what that information is, how it can it be packaged, who's regulating it, who's fact checking it. All that is sort of out of the window at the moment, right? It's, it's, it's the wild west out there. And like uh, 
uh, in earlier cases when terror groups in the 90s are building you know ieds uh, 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 using um, uh, chemicals or uh, you know uh, electronics that uh, that were available at that point of time to them this is what is available to them now and it's uh, it, it's easy to use uh, there are millions and millions of more people that are consuming this than what uh, the, the the terror groups had access to uh, 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 you know a, a decade ago or even two decades ago so uh, no, this whole concept of decentralization uh, has changed uh, changed uh, how we look at terrorism. Now, you know, it's there are two ways to look at it, in my opinion. Uh, one is uh, how do you look at it strategically and how do you look at it tactically? Right. So strategically, of course, uh, if you see, uh, let's say, uh, the online space, right, social media. The term social in social media is quite contested in my view now. It's not what it uh, or any of the platform that started as, oh, we are going to just share our family photos with our friends or who's dating who or, you know, everything that Facebook started as. It's not that anymore, right? So the, it, it has evolved into something very much different at a very rapid pace. And the policy response to that has been very slow. Especially in the in in the security sphere. I mean, uh, I remember. Uh, I'm not sure how many of uh, how many people in the audience are familiar with the name Shami Witness. He used to be a, uh, for the lack of a better term, character on on Twitter, who uh, uh, was a very sort of vocal proponent on on ISIS, basically when it was starting up in 2013, and and. He, I think he went unchecked for a good three years, uh, you know, uh, trying to tell people how to get to Syria and Iraq, trying to tell people why they should be joining ISIS, uh, uh, so on and so forth. And very publicly, I had conversations with him, right, uh, in, in, uh, through Twitter on direct messaging. At that time, I was a journalist and I was just curious to as this who person is, who this person is, and, um, you know, what, uh, why... A, a, he does this person have 35,000 odd followers on, on, on Twitter. And for most efforts, people couldn't find out who he was. Uh, you know, I, even the Channel 4 documentary that came out that outed the guy um, as being uh, someone in Bangalore only happened because British intelligence at that time thought that it's actually someone in, in, in the surrounding areas uh, to London. So they started looking there. Uh, of course, someone uh, of South Asian origin. When they found out they actually that it's actually no one from uh, that part of the world, they informed the Indian establishment, and that's how it sort of sort of came out. Uh, uh, you know who this person was. So, it, and we haven't you know uh, reached very far from where we were back then. Uh, you, you know, it, of course, now the the reaction is to ban accounts and. Uh, yeah, to try and deplatform uh, uh, these uh, these kind of accounts and so on and so forth, but even if you see, uh, as Daniel mentioned, you know the advent of end-to-end -end encryption, encryption, which is a strain amalgamation of freedom of speech being used uh, by um, you know, sort of uh, 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 you know elements such as the Islamic State or uh, pro-Islamic State ideologues. You know, openly propagating on platforms such as Telegram even today, uh, 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 it raises questions of what the policy response is. I'm not talking about technological response here. Right? The technological response can be as per the platform, as per the understanding of the platform with the local laws of the country that they're operating in. But uh, the policy response I've found that is always going to be one step behind. And uh, it's I don't see this changing anytime soon. I, I, I think the pace of technology is something that is going to outpace policy, at least in the in in the in the in the future in the near future to come. And we have to, you know, devise our responses around this problem, right? Of how do you respond to something that is uh, that you're responding to right now, which has already taken place, and you're responding to something that has already evolved into something else. Uh, but now then your next step is going to be catch up to something that is already evolving, you know, even further. 
and that we we've seen that uh, you know we've seen uh, twitter and facebook come to some sort of let's say uh, understanding of how to deal with these accounts uh, some sort of institutions being built around it as daniel mentioned you know gct is one with, where academics and policy makers are coming together to see how hash sharing can be done how uh, uh, local uh, governments can get involved how smaller platforms can get involved right and that's a very important question as well for example a small platform in india uh could mean 50 million users that's a massive platform anywhere on the planet whether it's small here or not so how did do, how does a team of let's say 6 or 10 people uh uh fighting between uh upscaling as a business and uh, also having the responsibility of uh, of securitizing their uh platform which is not cheap by any shape or form how do these uh, uh, problems uh, uh, or what are the answers that coexist with each other for these problems so uh, i think there there are some uh, very fundamental issues that we are uh, already facing for which not enough answers specifically from an indian point of view not enough answers are, are available you know uh, banning a platform or saying look localize your data or give us access to your data and all that is a very short term sort of you know uh, criteria of how uh, uh, how to deal with this if you have an answer that comes today there will be a counter to that within next few days that's how i think the designs of uh, uh, of how technology is playing a part with modern terrorism is uh, is, is is sort of being is uh, sort of being built and i think uh, one more point that i would like to raise is uh, that we have to get over a fact that a lot of i think mostly states think is that there is some sort of exclusive exclusivity to technology that 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 a certain technology is exclusive to a state or or to a company or uh, and i'm not talking about you know iprs and stuff here i'm talking about usability of how they have designed it and how what the outcome of that technology is going to be is not what the company or the state decides it's however that a person or an object or a or a militant group chooses to mold itself like for example i'll give you a, a very quick example when uh, the delhi riots happened last year uh, 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 i think it was february 2020 but i can't i can't remember uh, uh, you know south al hind which was a uh, like a small sort of uh, group on telegram sort of you know translating a lot of uh, pro islamic state propaganda into hindi uh, uh, suddenly came out with a with a magazine issue within like 3 4 days of uh, since the riot started uh, uh, basically trying to piggy back on the discord that was happening in delhi and you know using that using that and using social media to uh, uh, to amplify uh, the the ideology that they were propagating especially to, uh, aimed at indian muslims uh, uh, and they put the they put the uh, uh, you know some provocative images that were uh, that were taken uh, by the press during that time as they cover inside it was a shoddily done job it wasn't a great you know uh, 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 great piece of work like we've seen dabik come out and so on and so forth it wasn't that that level but it quickly became that level it's sort of that level now right so there has been a consistent effort since then to try and put it out uh, 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 in a much more sort of packaged manner now i have also noticed for example telegram has taken down accounts consistently that have been uh, uh, you know uh, uh, publishing sort of uh, sotal hind online and uh, you know if it's not telegram they will shift to another platform for a month uh, whether that be rocket chat or something much smaller that uh, is sort of not in the in the vision of uh, uh, of 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 most uh, uh, people uh, either studying this or tracking this and you know after let's say a, a, a lull of activity uh, over a month or two they'll come back to telegram right because uh, uh, you know it's not let's be honest deplatforming and then going to another platform you are going to lose momentum right but then they do come back 
and and uh, you see similar levels of activity you know then then getting back again and this is a cycle that repeats right and i think and i do find that I, I, you know a lot of these groups are okay with that you know it's it, it's uh, they they have spread their sort of uh, uh, butter so thin uh, on so many platforms now that it, it becomes very hard to to completely um, try and uh, you know uh, banish them from the internet if that's if that's the aim right of course the aim of a platform will stop by uh, by uh, you know making sure that it, their platform is not the not the one that is being chosen to amplify this kind of content uh, you know initially from the indian indian point of view it was facebook in uh, between 2013 and 2015 16 and it wasn't even uh, uh, led by uh, largely led by the islamic state or like propagators of the islamic state it was just people who you know were talking to each other about the ideology they were watching the propaganda online and they decided that we are going to try and find like minded people you know it was as basic as that in the beginning before islamic state itself or at least their sort of online ecosystem started seeing patterns within this ecosystem in india and started trying to tap into that without much success as we all know but uh, but uh, still so uh, uh, you know one and one final point that i'll make is uh, why i started this by saying as strategic and tactical being two ways even in the digital front that we need to divide this in is because now we are of course seeing technological sort of uh, innovation being used by militant groups offline as well as online right so uh, uh, a drone being sort of uh, modded to drop an armament is also recording it for the online sphere right so whatever it does even if it is shot down even if you know the the other side or the state says look we we shot five drones down but if the video of that sort of uh, armament falling into a populated area or onto a military site um it does make rounds make circulation is seen as a successful uh, move by by the militant group whether they lose the drone or not is quite irrelevant beyond the point of time so messaging has become to a certain extent more important than the kinetic part of it right so the strategic part has become much more than the important than the kinetic part of it so if we divide this in divide this into these two categories to begin with i think it would be much easier to both study and come up with policy responses in accordance to what exactly you have narrowed down to on what you are fighting because the whole tech we are uh, you know that the militants are now using technology is a very very broad sort of uh, field uh, and any policy response to such a broad field is going to be broad in nature and that's not really a good thing so i'll just stop my comments there thank you so much kabir uh another super interesting angle in terms of just delving into the trends that surround this as well as addressing any possible mitigation or resolution uh to how essentially how we would see this going forward so um thank you for that we have several questions for both kavir and daniel so uh, i'll start with the first that came in from colonel atavale which is uh which is that uh the dark web is also being used for trading in contraband and cbrn materials could you tell us about this aspect of the use of web in of course um illegal activities and terrorism uh this is particularly pointed towards daniel Okay, thanks very challenging question uh, actually uh, we were researching this kind of uh, technology or chemical weapons and so on being brought from uh, hezbollah and uh, hamas organizations it's a bit tricky because those organizations are state sponsored Iranians uh, sponsoring them also on technology uh, I have to say that uh, I didn't see any indication on the dark net or dark web of any kind of transactions or even talks regarding it. It doesn't mean that it's not there because I'm not uh, replacing the NSA or GCHQ. So I, I presume it's somewhere there. There are 
secure the communication between them, but uh, because it's uh, a more uh, strategic weapons uh, or components that you need to purchase somewhere on a dark mar market, most of the uh, uh, revealing that we saw regarding it that was uh, on open source, that was revealed on the media, was a waste of uh, dealers all around the world trying to buy this kind of uh, of uh, weapons or components for those weapons. Actually, not only CBRN, but also for drones and also for uh, missiles. When the component is more uh, expensive, strategic, uh, exclusive in a way, you need someone on the ground uh, to go and look for it and uh, deal with other people that. Uh, what is called uh, using the information uh, security, then you, you, it's really hard to see them uh, operating on forums on the darknet. So at least I, again, I didn't see it. I presume that somewhere you can see it over there. But most of the arrests were in spring operations of uh, law enforcement, of very experienced dealers that they did it one-on-one uh, -on -one in meetings, in hotels all around the world. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. I think we've got a lot of interesting questions. Uh, I'll go to the next one. Uh, this is for Kabir. You mentioned that the influence of policy may not make such a difference in the near future in comparison to technology. What, according to you, can help policymakers jumpstart more influence of their recommendations in tackling social terrorism? Uh, that's a very good question and the answer is very simple that policy needs to make policy that enables technology. Technology will fight technology. That's how it is going to be, right? Policy barriers in trying to, uh, you know, manage technology or regulate technology in a certain, in a way that is going to take time, that is going to be uh, uh, difficult to set up, that is going to uh, be time, uh, you know, uh, bureaucratic heavy. Uh, bureaucracy heavy, sorry, uh, all these kind of barriers for technology firms that are looking to help uh, or looking to do joint work in, in this field is something that needs to be done away with. It, it, the answer will come from within the technology sphere. It is not going to come from the policy sphere, but policy considering, you know, is what, I mean, uh, from a state's perspective, uh, most, uh, uh, you know, technology companies are based around needs to enable technology companies to do the same. All right, thank you. Uh, Nazarene, I hope that answers the question. Uh, if, if you have any follow-ups, please put it in the chat box. Uh, next one. Uh, Daniel, in your netnographic model shown at the end, can we maximize the benefits without turning a potential uniocracy into some kind of panopticon? Leaving traditional terrorism aside for a moment, civil sector threatened less by private sector and government in models less stark than Israel or India? This is a question from Oliver. Thanks, Oliver. Uh, just to fine tune it to the side of the private sector. I didn't mean the big uh, social media tech companies from the Silicon Valley or other places. I actually meant that we need to see more uh, private sector companies or startups that will deal with phenomena like disinformation, fake news, uh, to organizations use of the social media and uh, instant messaging. And I think in the end of the day, there's a, of course there's a chance that we some kind of a government trying to oppose their prioritize to the private sector and uh, the academic world, and we don't want to see that. But it can be a platform, first of all, for sharing of information between all of the three sectors. I think this is the main problem, mainly when the, let's say, the law enforcement acts very covertly, doesn't share information with others. The private sector companies that deal, for example, uh, in a uh, in uh, automated automation of a uh, of fusion of big data for multiple multiple sources that can be cross-checked, 
and then maybe there's a chance for them also to uh, assist uh, law enforcement on that aspect. We don't see any sharing of information between them, so I think this needs to be promoted. And the way to do so without, the, let's say, the government interference would be by government funding the academic world to encourage the private companies uh, or startups in this kind of field uh, to build uh, uh, platforms, to build tools, methods that can be produced on the academic world, and then we will see more sharing of information between uh, those. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, I think we'll take the next question, which I think uh, I think both both speakers can uh, provide their comments on. From Rahul Kumar, what is the role of the Financial Ta Action Task Force in preventing terrorism by curtailing the financial transactions in channeling? Uh, terrorist funding and safe havens of terrorism operating. Kabir, would you like to go first? Uh, sure. Uh, look, that's that's. I think that's a very specific tool that states can use to put pressure on other states uh, when it comes to terrorism and uh, state-funded terrorism specifically. It's useful there. I mean. Uh, uh, I think one of the spaces where a lot of strides have actually been made is in terror finance and how to curtail terror finance. It's not as easy as it used to be. Uh, and uh, a lot of work has uh, been done on it specifically from an Indian point of view. Even if you see in the Indian private sector, banks that are operating have really large uh, uh, sections now when it comes to uh, tracking, uh, you know, uh, financial uh, finances that are leaving the country or entering the country that may have alternative uh, or sorry ulterior motives than just being you know regular financial transactions uh, but beyond a point i mean uh, it totally it depends on the situation i think it's very difficult to uh, um, general generalize it i mean if you see the islamic state for a decent period of time they were raising most of the money by themselves um, uh, you can't really beyond a point put uh, that under sanctions you know if they are controlling the crude refineries if they are taxing the citizens and so on and so forth it's very difficult to uh, to uh, and spending sort of the, that money you know within court i mean so within the, the geographical frame framework where they're operating then it becomes fairly difficult to uh, you know track their finances or sanction them to any beneficial uh, uh, you know, outcome. But otherwise, I do think, uh, you know, uh, uh, institutions such as the FATF are very valuable pressure valves, which we have seen uh, work out fairly well against uh, countries such as Pakistan, uh, you know, uh, both from uh, not just in Indian, but from an American point of view as well. Uh, but uh, uh, I think it, it, it can get more difficult if, uh, if you're seeing it from uh, the perspective of militant groups that are operating within the confines of a geography that's really not in anyone's control. So there are benefits and of it doesn't work at some time. But overall, I think uh, uh, terror finance in general is one field where a uh, uh, lot of uh, uh, good has been done over the past couple of years. I agree with Kabir. Uh, I think there are places where we see gaps. I will give you one example. Drug trafficking, for example, and uh, funding of terrorism by it. When you have a terror organization that also deals with drugs and selling them and then money laundering it, it's different from a cartel somewhere in the South America that deals with it. Why? Because the structure is different. Uh, we see the example of, again, Hezbollah that I like to use, but also other uh, terror organizations. Um, we saw the Americans, for example, building years ago this huge uh, fusion center that will deal with also uh, terror organizations like Hezbollah, but also with drug trafficking from the understanding that uh, you need to share the information between different agencies and different platforms because of this asymmetric war, because there's a terror organization involved in it, and it funds part of its activity. 
the gap happens in countries where there is no sharing of information between law enforcement that deals with, uh, again, drug trafficking or criminal activities, uh, like police, uh, to the uh, organization in the country that deals with terrorism or with uh, uh, actions by terrorism that are outside the country. Uh, like, uh, the, for example, the difference between uh, police and FBI. When it happens in those countries, then we see the problem, because again, there's no sharing of information and the police or the law enforcement that deals with drugs doesn't have the tools uh, from the government or the laws that can enable him to deal with a terror uh, organization that operates completely differently. Thank you both for your comments uh, on this. And I hope that it satisfies uh, the discursive uh, requirement on this. Uh, I think I'll take, we've got just about three minutes to go. So I'll take another question directed to both speakers, which is that uh, it's from Radhika. As we talk of use of cyberspace to propagate terrorism, one key success point is its persuasion and seamless psychological targets to low masses towards action. Keeping this in mind, is it more strategic to work towards smart policy implementation? Um, so again, I think both speakers can answer this. Uh, Kabir, if you'd like to go first. I, I do also have a sort of add on to that, which is that, like you mentioned in your talk and implied, uh, terrorism or at least extremism has always existed and there have been always just use of what's available as times change. So historically, are there any solutions that we can look at which would still apply to the new age tech situation as it stands currently? Oh, all right. That's a very difficult question. It's, you know, it's like within the technology sphere, there is no one answer for anything, right? So, it, it, you, of course, you can you can take, uh, especially when it comes to, um, uh, you know, some of the formats in which uh, radicalization has been dealt with in India, for example. Uh, let's see if, if you take uh, the example of of of, uh, of Kashmir, uh, where uh, uh, offline has uh, always taken precedence than online. And there is always this sort of lingering fear that, oh, what happens when this all goes nuts and they have, everyone has 4G there. And, uh, you know, that was sort of a line, like a base for uh, the internet shutdowns, uh, at least at some argumentative level that uh, that plagued the valley till, till today. Uh, you know, it's, as far as policy goes, you know, internet, you know, shutting down the internet is not policy, it's reaction, right? So you've not come to a solution to anything. You just made the problem go away. And that's not, uh, you know, that is not a, a very sort of uh, good way to go about it long term, right? Uh, because uh, technology specifically, if you see 4G and the use of social media and so on and so forth is so intertwined with uh, with uh, with our lives, and you have to remember that 99.99 percent people are not using it for terrorism, right? So it's the 0.1 percent cannot necessarily uh, lead the policy response. So and that has to be uh, uh, that has to be taken into account. So uh, it's you know it's not. Uh, wise to say to see it from the perspective that what can we learn from before that can be applicable uh, in the current scenario because the tools for uh, for challenging the current uh, uh, online sphere as far as the use of technology goes by militant actors and terror groups uh, they i mean they are very fast evolving right because technology as i said technology is the one that is going to have answers to this uh, uh, it goes beyond the sort of, uh, 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 you know, prerogative of, uh, of older policies uh, or older experiences that we may have had earlier, sort of translating into uh, uh, online experiences now. It doesn't sort of translate very well. 
as far as platforms go, right? So even when you have, let's say, a de-radicalization program that is designed for a face-to-face -face interaction that cannot be taken and uh, digitized and ap applied uh, as an online one as well, right? So it just doesn't work work that way. And I'm saying using this example because it has been tried here before and failed miserably. So every, you know, you have to give, uh, you have to give every uh, problem that is coming out of the tech world as far as terrorism or radicalization goes, uh, it's fair due uh, in thought and uh, and a response. It, uh, uh, you may have to take a little bit from here and there to uh, patch up and present something or it has to, it to be completely something new. I will add uh, my two cents on that, that uh, maybe the problem is with the strategy, not the policy. And we actually see an effective policy uh, between uh, governments or international organizations and the uh, social media companies. Again, we see a progress. <laughs> but as Kabir said, we, what, is a, what can be done with a smaller apps or platforms, that's maybe the main question, because we saw the terrorists understanding that they can't operate freely as we've been doing in five and seven years ago on the main platform, and then we saw them moving, switching into the smaller platforms that provided them freedom for speech and also encryption from the other side of it. So here we see maybe a strategy need to be crafted with understanding that okay, what is our next step when we understand now that those uh, terrorists are operating in different platforms? So if we pressure Facebook and uh, Twitter, it's not enough now. So maybe there's a lack of strategy there. And uh, regarding the policy, I do believe that we need to see more regulation uh, on the companies. But from the other side of it, I don't think this will give you the remediation, the cure uh, to stop terrorism, of course. So the main things need to be, again, by creating uh, awareness and uh, sharing the information between them. And uh, we do see a lot of effective models by the social media companies and their own policy towards it. And this needs to be adapted also to, again, to the smaller platform apps and so on for, to further this communication recruitment to the organization. I'll just quickly add to what Daniel just said, just last point. Uh, you know, we've, we've tried to have uh, conversations in, in India with smaller platforms uh, on how they can, uh, you know, build capacity to fight uh, or at least, uh, you know, recognize what, what is problematic content, what are pro the problematic groups that they need to be look out for that can co-op their platforms and, and so on and so forth. We've tried having those exercises in Delhi, for example, and most of the smaller platforms don't attend because they just don't have the manpower dedicated to that right so because they are businesses right so they whatever little capacity they are raising as funding goes to their you know whatever marketing sales etc 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 this does not feature yet in the top priority list of platforms or smaller companies right and i think that needs to change so uh, you know as daniel was saying the sharing of information you know create ecosystems between academia policy and the platform so that they don't have to hire maybe someone but they can tap into some resource if required and that resource you know either funded by the state or whatever however it comes up then can actually help them give some advice on who this group is or what do they need to do or what what kind of policy are they looking at as a platform that they should be reacting to certain type of content so, but something needs to give, right? Something needs to done because the current scenarios in most countries, and I just gave India as an example, it's not working out. There are too many gaps everywhere while, and every gap seems, seems to be working in a silo at the moment. Thank you so much both for your comments. Uh, I'll move on quickly to, I know we are exceeding, but we've just got a lot of questions. I'll move on to two questions for uh, Daniel first, and then two questions for Kabir. First for Daniel from Sravan is, um, sorry. Okay. The, 
Yeah, the first for Daniel from Pr Premdeep would be, we also need to understand the discipline uh, involved in using technology to radicalize and recruit. That's what motivates extremist groups. Do you think the trend started in the late 2000s using apps like Facebook and Twitter remains a primary source of radicalization and recruitment? Or are there more preferred apps used such as WhatsApp, Telegram and others? That's the first question. And then uh, we also have another question, which is how are extremist groups using fake news and misinformation to further their agenda? That's a question from Sravan. Okay, two very good questions and I will try to answer quickly because I understand we are uh, proceeding. So first of all, uh, for the question on uh, the radicalization, the first at first we saw a uh, radicalization being happened on the public sphere, on uh, at least in the case of organizations that uh, evil deal with, it was in the uh, religious centers, in mosques. We saw it also on the TV, on radio. But in the end of the day, the main uh, process of radicalization happened when there's a recruiter that meets someone, can be outside the religious center and start to talk to him and after a process he will be put into the uh, terror organization. I believe it's the same here in this case. Uh, Facebook and other main platforms, what they did, they uh, provided to those terror organizations, especially ISIS, maximum exposure online. And if you have a maximum exposure, you can, in percentages, get to more people on one-on-one -on -one, in a private discussion, uh, starting on a content that you're sharing uh, to someone, but it will continue and it will evolve and it will take time in the DM when someone will talk privately to someone else. What we did see from the other side of it, we did see spontaneous terror attacks of people that were not part of any hierarchical organization, were not affiliated to ISIS as operatives, but were supporters, but we did see spontaneous attacks or lone wolf attacks by people that were inspired only from the content that they received uh, very, in a very vibrant way and a dynamic way from those uh, uh, social media. So maybe it can give us a, a understanding why we see less lone wolf attacks now, why we see less people being getting uh, recruited to those organizations. But again, we need to remember that we still see exclusive forms on the darknet or in insight uh, messaging. People receive uh, tons of uh, content from those organizations. So it acts differently, but it didn't uh, uh, really stop, but it didn't change it. But uh, yes, we see less exposure towards new targeted audience. Now to the second question, uh, I will say that it uh, differs between uh, uh, maybe some part of your next session, session next week, is it uh, geopolitical or ideological? It differs between those organizations that have territories, have assets, have something to lose, like Hamas, like the Islamic State at some point, not now, but it, yes, they had the uh, territories. Uh, meaning that if you are now fighting, you're in the middle of the fight, you're trying to concur and uh, take more territories or defend your own territories, you will act differently from uh, you now trying to spread ideological ideas. So actually, um, in my, it's a speculation. I didn't uh, really check it, so I can't give you the quantitative results on it. But I believe that if you have something to lose, if you have territories, if you are now in a fight, in a conflict, in an armed one, then we will see more uh, fake news and disinformation campaigns uh, because you are, now you are in a more urgent uh, uh, times. When you're only trying to uh, craft your own political ideas and implement them uh, in a new world order or in, a, in some country, and you're mostly uh, acting in a psyops against your opposition or your opposer, and you are trying to recruit more uh, recruitment to your own organization, 
you will again act differently. For your own people that you're trying to recruit, you need to be unified, you need to be coherent. You don't use fake news. You actually need to use news and uh, information that will persuade them to join you. But if you are now using it for psychological warfare against your opponent, then again, we will see the use of uh, fake news and disinformation in a very sometimes sophisticated way targeted. We have tons of examples from other uh, aspects like, uh, uh, example, elections, times when we see uh, different narratives for different uh, targeted audience. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, On to the questions for Kavir now. There are two again. Uh, you mentioned that the influence of policy may not make such a difference in the near future in comparison to technology. What, according to you, can make help policy makers jumpstart more influence of their recommendation in tackling social terrorism? That's from Aishwarya. And secondly, we have a question from... Uh, someone whose username is NGS20. They say, can social marginali marginalization still be seen as a causal factor for recruitment to terrorism, even though new age tech has seeped in? Uh, okay, two very dif difficult questions to answer from this perspective specifically. Look, uh, I'll try to bundle both into one because they're not too far from each other. And I don't like particularly know whether this whole, I mean, of course, social marginalization is uh, a driving factor in many cases uh, when it comes to radicalization and extremism, but it's not an exclusivity, uh, you know, point of radicalization itself. Uh, if you see, uh, for example, uh, uh, and I think also it, then it comes down to what is social marginalization uh, or how is social marginalization defined here, right? Uh, uh, is it economic? Is it societal? Is it political? Is it a, a bunch of all of those? Uh, you know, uh, because if you see, if see from an argument, I mean, argumentative point of view, uh, if let's say uh, the political marginalization was a really a large driving factor towards extremism in India, we would have seen many, many more cases of people mobilizing towards that than what we have over the past many years, right? And I'm not talking about, um, um, uh, you know, the, the rise of ISIS right now. I'm talking about even the first Afghan war against the Soviets. Then, and Mujahideens from around the world were sort of, uh, you know, landing in Afghanistan to to back up the Mujahideen against this against the Soviet Union. Very very few people went from India, and same was the story uh, 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 during the rise of Islamic State as well. Uh, and you know, it it it's uh, because even if you see the couple of cases that are uh, uh, that came to public view. Uh, especially of those who went to Afghanistan to join IS Khorasan. Uh, again, how are we defining marginali marginalized here? They were university level, most of them. Uh, uh, Well-educated. They were not coming from abject poverty backgrounds and so on and so forth. And we have known cases that have emit, like that have come from India from abject poverty that have contacted Islamic State's online presence, have received uh, responses from them, but uh, uh, their poverty was the predominant reason why they could not join the Islamic State, because the whole idea of joining the Islamic State was not actually to stay in India, is to actually travel, is to take the holy journey, and to actually go and live under Sharia. That's the whole sort of uh, program, so to speak, that you're buying into, right? So, uh, uh, you know, as far as, uh, you know, Policy in, in these cases, unfortunately or fortunately, I'm not sure, uh, from largely an offline point of view, will have to be ad hoc. You have to deal it from case to case basis. You have to remember, for example, uh, 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 
one of the first two boys from Kalyan that went to fight for Islamic State from Syria, we were fine with them coming back to India. Why? Because we could make a counter narrative out of it. Right? We could tell, look, these guys went there, they were humiliated, treated Indian Muslims were treated as third class citizens, they were not allowed to fight, so on and so forth. Right? Uh, now, uh, we also have four you know, Indian women who had joined ISIS in Afghanistan, who we are not going to get back anytime soon. Why? Because all of that still remains, right? Uh, you can still make a counter narrative out of it, but the public opinion will not allow you to you know, get them back, right? So it, 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 a lot of variables come into play here when you're talking about policy, right? And in, uh, policy and uh, issues such as social marginalization. Uh, so taking them as umbrella arguments is, uh, uh, I mean, it's helpful till a very small extent. Right, so we'll have to be very uh, niche in our approaches about how we are dealing with this, often case-to-case -case basis, as sloppy as them, but that may sound. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I hope that sort of clarifies a fairly complex issue. And I think I should hope that it does. It does bring up some very salient points in terms of how we really look at who is the one that's kind of finally getting there because yeah it's true that like the main assumption is that it's marginalized people in abject poverty without economic means who turn to this sort of action so yeah that thanks kabir for that anyway uh we're way beyond time now and unfortunately we have a lot more interesting questions and follow-up questions from anurag oliver nazreen gaurav pallavi sorry uh we won't be able to take them uh i think this has been super interesting discursive and uh informative so thank you kabir thank you daniel for engaging uh so nicely with these questions. I'll hand over to Pallavi to close now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Sangam. And I am really sorry to everyone because you know those questions did not get answered. Uh, unfortunately, in trust of time. Uh, but definitely reach out to the speakers individually. I'm sure they'll be happy to answer your questions. And again, thank you to Simran, Kabir, and Daniel for this fantastic discussion. And we do look forward to hosting you in our future session. So have a good weekend, everyone. Take care and stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.